get started, I think. My name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our, our, our uh, event today. We're actually very privileged and honored to have with us uh, Abbas Milani, who is the director of Iranian Studies at Stanford University. We, uh, it was very fortuitous for us. He happened to be coming into the area. We were able to nab him. He'll also be speaking later tonight over at the University of Idaho if you want to go over there as well. Dr. Milani is uh, the, uh, not only the director of the Iranian Studies Program at Stanford University, he is also one of the co founding co-directors of the Iran Democracy Project. And he's also a research fellow at the Hoover Institute. Until 1986, Dr. Milani taught at uh, Tehran University's Faculty of Law and Political Science, where he was also a member of the board of directors at the university's Center for International Relations. Dr. Milani has been the chair of the political science department at the Notre Dame de Namur University and a visiting research fellow at the University of California, Berkeley Middle East Center. Dr. Milani has published more than 20 books and 200 articles in book reviews and scholarly magazines, journals, and newspapers. His latest book is entitled The Shah, which was recently published by Paul Graves and Macmillan. Join me now in uh, welcoming Dr. Milani. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. At Stanford, when they say uh, pizza and a talk, they usually mean about 15 people, some pizza, and an informal conversation. That's what I was uh, anticipating. Uh, I'm not sure this is working, but uh, is it working? It's working. It's working. Fantastic. Uh, in terms of the introduction, there is one thing that was missing from the introduction I should add. Um, if you read the websites in the Iranian uh, regime, particularly two years ago, uh, I'm also CIA's chief bagman for Iran. <laughs> uh, in the indictment they wrote against the 200 leaders of the opposition that they put on trial, they went at some length accusing me of being, along with Mike McFaul, who is now the U.S. ambassador to Russia, and Larry Diamond, the masterminds of the Green Revolution, and I, the bagman. And uh, there are a few millions left. If any of you have assured me uh, for your uh, tuition, see me after class. <laughs> uh, now, I teach a course, uh, in fact, this quarter at Stanford. Uh, we meet uh, three hours a day, a week, and there is a uh, session with the TA. That they meet two hours a week, so that's five hours a week for 10 weeks. And the subject is U.S.-Iran relation. Uh, so I'm trying to uh, combine in uh, 30 minutes what we usually do in about 50 hours. So I apologize if it's going to be uh, a lake with two, two inches of depth. Uh, and then I think we can talk about any of the issues that you'd like relating to U.S.-Iran relations. Uh, in the question and answer period. Uh, since I don't know what all of you know about Iran uh, and the U.S. relations, I'll give you a, a three-minute introduction to the history of the relationship, uh, a five-minute introduction to some of the more complicated moments in this history, and then talk about today, because today is really a very important moment in the trajectory of this very complicated uh, relationship. Uh, U.S.-Iran relations began in 1850, essentially, uh, and they were begun by one of the most famous reformist ministers in Iranian history named Amir Kabir. Amir Kabir was uh, decidedly anti-British. He was decidedly anti-Russian. 1850s were the time where the big game was beginning to take shape. Iran was a center of contention. Uh, Russia and Britain were fighting over Iran. and Amir Kabir had the wisdom to know that a distant, powerful friend is something good to have when you have two close uh, enemies fighting over you at, uh, nearby. So uh, relations began in 1850 officially. There were ambassadors uh, exchanged by late 19th century. Uh, but Iran's first encounter with Americans were the missionaries. The missionaries began to arrive en masse. And, uh, they virtually could not convert a single person. Uh, and the reason is very simple. Uh, if you are born a Muslim and you decide to convert out of Islam, uh, you can be executed. 
uh, the rest of you who are not born Muslim, you have the choice and privilege of changing your religion. But if you are born into the Islam, you have seen the light, and you can't then turn the light back. God will not look lightly upon that. So the rate of conversion was virtually zero. That has now changed. Now we have thousands of new converts to Christianity inside and outside Iran. It's really a very fascinating phenomenon. It's a PhD dissertation waiting to be written, comparing the failure of the missionaries in the first 140 years and their success in the last 30 years. But the missionaries uh, became enamored of Iran, and they decided to stay. Most of them stayed. <coughs> they created some of the first and best educational institutions in Iran. They did in Iran what the missionaries did in Egypt, they did in Lebanon, which was to go on and create American University in Lebanon, American University in Cairo, the first girls' school, the first nursing school in Tehran, by far the best high school in Tehran, in Iran, in 20th century, was created by a pair of American missionaries, the Jordans, who came and created what was called the American College and then was uh, renamed Albors. I say all of this because this helped create a very favorable image of the United States in Iran. To add one more uh, uh, instance, Iran had a democratic constitutional revolution in 1905. And by 1908, one of the people who died in that revolution was a missionary by the name of Baskerville. Baskerville was teaching in the city of Tabriz. He fought on the side of the Iranian Democrats and has become a revered martyr in Iran. So the U.S.'s image in Iran from 1850 to about 1953 is the image of this distant city on the hill, if you will, this distant, powerful country that doesn't seem to have colonial designs in the Middle East, is not involved with oil, and could be potentially useful in the fight against British and Russian and the Soviet Union. And the fact that the United States was instrumental uh, in trying to get, in fact, getting the Soviets out of Iran at the end of World War II added to this uh, image, the image that the United States could be helpful in the fight against uh, British and American uh, and Soviet uh, expansionism. To give you a sense of, again, how important the Iranian uh, situation was for the US after World War II, Iran is the only country, the only country where the Red Army had occupied part of the country and was forced to leave. At the end of World War II, everywhere the Red Army stayed, they created the People's Republic and they created some version of the satellite state. Iran was the only place where they were pushed out of Iran and the republics they had helped create, the two separatist republics they had helped create, was dismantled. Uh, and Truman claims, although the White House denies this, but Truman claims he gave uh, Stalin a nuclear ultimatum. Uh, the w State Department official historian says, we haven't yet found evidence of this actual ultimatum, but it was a very serious threat. So uh, British, uh, I mean, uh, Soviet forces withdrew from Iran, and uh, the image of the United States was still, up to 1953, uh, an image of a country that you could potentially use in the fight against uh, British and Soviet Union. All of that basically changes in 53. In 1953, uh, the United States takes a role, uh, and how much of a role it takes is a matter of a great deal of controversy and scholarly debate. But the United States and Britain come together and play a role. And if you want, we can talk about it because it's the 60th anniversary, and I've written it about it at length in my book on the, uh, the Shah. Uh, the United States has a role in the uh, overthrow of a government of Mossadegh. Mossadegh was a prime minister who came to power in 1951. He was a nationalist. He nationalized the British oil uh, interest in Iran. The British were extremely rapacious about the oil. The Americans knew as early as 1947 
that the British were not going to be able to keep uh, this agreement. They kept pressuring the British to change. They kept saying that this, you are being too uh, cruel. You know, Iran was uh, receiving less revenue from its oil than the British government was from the taxes it received from the British oil company. That, that uh, somebody has figured that the average amount, the, the average price of oil Iran received was less than 20 cents per barrel from 1908 to 1947. And the writing was on the wall. Uh, there was national, uh, nationalizing movements going on in Latin America. There was 50-50 percent profit sharing being discussed with Aramco in Saudi Arabia. And the Americans pushed the British. And the British have this view, uh, and I apologize for our the colleague here who's from Britain. The British have this view <laughs> that they understand the world better than these young uh, Yankees. Uh, in their private correspondence, they really lif lit literally refer to the Americans as these bumbling fools. Uh, they don't know their way about the Middle East. The British have been ruling there for 200 years. They should let them handle it. Uh, well, they handled it, and by 1951, Mossadegh came to power and nationalize them out of the oil. And uh, Britain's first instinct was to try to uh, attack Iran militarily. <coughs> the United States, the Truman administration was adamant, no military attack of, on Iran. And the United States does try to play, as I say, a mediating role. But by the end of 52, the United States decides that the left is rising in Iran. Mossadegh is weakening in Iran. And there might be a communist takeover. So they join forces. And they join forces very critically with the Shiite clergy who had by late 52 turned against Mossadegh. And together in August 53, overthrow the government of Mossadegh. That becomes the beginning of a new phase in US-Iran relations. Uh, Iran becomes one of the most important places where the U.S. has influence in the Middle East. But the image of the United States almost overnight changes. It goes from a city on the hill to the ugly uh, American. Uh, and the United States, although the, whatever you want to call what happened to Mossadegh, some call it a coup, the Shah calls it national uprising, whatever happened to Mossadegh, the British had far more important role in it. But the coup has come to be known, the CIA coup of 1953. It's a very interesting uh, play in historical uh, trajectories. The reason 53 is important is that uh, many people say, including that uh, rather stupid film called Argo, uh, <laughs> excuse me, for if I, I hope Mr. Aflac is not here, his relatives, uh, and don't tell him I said that. Uh, if, if you do know him. But it is a remarkably shallow film. And in the first five minutes, they make so many historical errors that it's embarrassing. If they had hired one of our undergraduates or your undergraduates and give them a hundred bucks and say, read this script and correct it, uh, they would have made a much better pitch. But the key to the story uh, is that the hostage taking was payback for 1953. That's how the film begins. And it's an absurd uh, premise because the people who actually took over the embassy, the, cler the students and the clergy, uh, Mr. Khomeini particularly, hated Mossadegh. They thought of Mossadegh as an infidel. Mo Khomeini is on record. So to say that this is payback for that, it is a little too easy uh, historical narrative. It, it fits and it works. Somebody even wrote a book saying that September 11 was payback for uh, August 53. I mean, it's a free country. P people can say whatever the hell they want. But to <laughs> say that September 11, when 19 Arabs are involved, and most of them probably had never heard the name of Mossadegh, is payback for August 53 is a kind of historical narrative that sells books but doesn't clarify history. But the U.S. becomes very involved in Iran after 53. The, between 53 to 61, the U.S. gives to Iran over $1 billion in aid, military assistance, and uh, loans. 
it is one of the biggest periods in U.S. foreign aid uh, giving in this period because, again, they're worried about whether the Shah can stay in power, <coughs> and they try to uh, create an atmosphere where there's some stability. The Kennedys come to power in 61, and the Kennedys despise the Shah. They find the Shah to be a despot. They find him to be a corrupt uh, uh, leader. And they push him to change Iranian society, to open up the system. They literally push a prime minister on him called Amini, which was a powerful uh, prime minister compared to the people who came before him or after him. And the US essentially forces a kind of modernization uh, ch set of uh, interrelated changes in Iran, that in Iran that was called the White Revolution. If you want to understand the roots of the Iranian Revolution of 79, that's where you need to look. Because they essentially, and if you understand that, I, I suggest you would also understand what is happening in Turkey, you would understand what is happening in Egypt, because uh, more or less the same sociological process is happening. And prim primarily conservative, uh, village economy, feudal economy, is being transformed into an urban capitalist economy, a cash economy. Iran has the biggest migration in its history from the countryside to the city within 10 years, from 1961 to 1979. You have a society that is 90, 85 percent uh, village to a society that is now 60 percent. Uh, uh, urban, 50 percent urban, depending on how you define urban, how big the village has to be before it's a uh, town. And you have this remarkable transformation. Ahmadinejad, who you have all heard, is part of this migration. Ahmadinejad's family comes from a village to the city. They can't make ends meet in the village. They bring with them all their values and their cultural values. And you have the creation of these uh, metropolises. In Tehran, the city goes from a village of uh, 100,000, for example, an overgrown village, to a city of five, six million. And in this process, in the process that the United States was pressuring the Shah to undertake, it was a change in the social fabric. It was urbanization. It was capitalism. But it was also supposed to include democracy. It was also supposed to include pressuring the Shah to open up the system. But by 63, Kennedy is no longer there. By 65, the price of oil begins to increase. The Shah is now less dependent on uh, the US. By 68, you have Richard Nixon. And who orders Nis Nixon and Kissinger basically tell the State Department, lay off the Shah. Don't pressure him to democratize. So exactly as this Iranian society was going into a trajectory that needed opening, the Shah began to close the system more and more. There was only one force he allowed to openly, actively organize. Every political force was eliminated, virtually. The only force were the religious, because the Shah believed that the greatest threat to him came from the left. And he thought that the force that could stop the left were the religious forces. The Americans were not discouraging this idea. But during the Nixon era, where the US needed to be most pressuring the Shah to open up, the Nixon uh, administration had no desire to do it. And the Shah, because of his newfound wealth, had more independence. He wasn't, uh, you know, he didn't have to listen. So. You have the, the, you know, wh when I went back to Iran in 75, you could clearly see that this was a society that cannot uh, continue. Uh, because you have had these changes, and then the Shah was ruling as if this was a 19th century uh, Oriental potentate. He suddenly decided to create a one party system. So all of this is being seen by the Iranian population as the machinations of the US. The Iranian secret police uh, is, becomes notorious, uh, although compared to what has happened in Iran afterwards, they seem like Sunday school teachers. 
but uh, I, I really mean that. I mean, uh, uh, this regime has made even Sabak look like it was not as brutal as it in fact was. Uh, uh, and, and by way of disclosure, I have to say that I was in the Shah's prison for about a year. So uh, take that into account in listening to everything I say. Uh, but uh, Sabak was deemed correctly by everyone to be essentially a U.S. British creation. After a while, uh, Israel was also involved in training uh, Sabak. So whatever uh, the accusations were against Sabak, the United States got some of the blame as well. So the image began to change. And the relationship between U.S. and Iran began to become very, very close, except on two issues, oil and nuclear. On oil, the Nixon administration and the Ford administration could not get the Shah to roll back the price of oil. That's why eventually the uh, United States went and made a deal with the Saudis. This has been written very brilliantly in an article uh, called From Doha to Tehran. Carpenters has written it in the Middle East uh, Journal. You can see it. It's based on Nixon papers and Scowcroft's papers and uh, Kissinger's papers. And it shows clearly they tried to get the Shah to roll back the price of oil. The Shah wouldn't play ball. So they went and made a deal with Saudis and kept the price of oil uh, from rising. And as the Shah was beginning to talk more and more grandiosely about the great civilization, as he had brought in these millions of people into the city and promising them, as he repeatedly said, lifestyles comparable to Germany and Japan, the Iranian economy went into a, a downfall from 75, 76. <laughs> and uh, Carter comes to power, and Carter begins to pressure the Shah now for democratization. So you have the makings of a perfect storm. The Shah has cancer. He discovers he has cancer. He's taking medication. He's not telling anybody. We still don't know whether the Americans knew it or not, whether the British knew it or not. I heard from the Israeli uh, ambassador to Iran. He claims they knew it, but I can't find any evidence that they actually knew it or shared it with anybody. Uh, but the Shah was sick. An economy that was going at 20% growth rate was now suddenly needing to borrow money in 76. And rising expectations, because the Shah kept promising uh, standards of living comparable to Germany. That's a perfect recipe for uh, a revolution. If that's not enough, at that precise moment where you have this conjunction of these uh, remarkable uh, events, the Carter administration comes and says, you have to open up the system. You have to uh, uh, respect human rights. So from the time of Aristotle, it's been a known fact of political theory that for despotic regimes, the most dangerous is not when they are at the height of their despotism, but when they begin to open it up. Because years, decades, centuries of oppressed feelings and sentiments and desires for participation suddenly burst open into the open. That's exactly what happened in Iran. And who was the force there that could organize it and mobilize it? Who was the only force that had the capacity, the wherewithal, the uh, cadres, the financial backing? It was the religious forces. And it was then that the United States decides. All of this is now very much out in the open. The documents are out. The declassified material is out. Late 1978, the United States decides that, uh, you looked at your watch, got me worried. Uh, uh, the late in 78, the United States decides that uh, they should pressure the Shah to leave Iran and that the alternative is Khomeini. Have, I, I think it is. Uh, you, one can say with some certainty, without the intervention of U.S. government, without the intervention of U.S. embassy, the 1979 revolution would not have happened the way it happened. The United States embassy was actively trying
trying to demobilize the Iranian military from organizing a coup in favor of the Shah. They were actively trying to bring together Khomeini forces and the leaders of the military. And it worked. It worked. And by February 1979, the United States, uh, the Shah uh, was overthrown. Khomeini was back in power. And Khomeini had essentially uh, promised the Americans in these negotiations to bring a kind of a democratic Islamic iteration. He had repeatedly said during these negotiations that he would not, nor would any clergy, have any role in the future <coughs> politics of Iran. So the first government that came was more or less a government that the United States understood. It was a government of Iranian technocrats, Iranian uh, followers of Mossadegh, but with a religious bent. That didn't last long. And the hostage crisis was one of the tools that Khomeini used to completely marginalize his democratic allies, his liberal allies, his leftist allies. By the end of the hostage crisis, you have the beginning of the rise of the Islamic radical clergy to power. In between, the United States is very much trying to establish good relations with uh, Iran. As late as uh, November, uh, two weeks before the hostage crisis, the CIA was giving briefings to the Iranian regime saying that from their satellite images, it looks like uh, Iraq is organizing to attack Iran. That's how much they were <coughs> help, trying to help. The hostage crisis changed all of that. The guys who were getting the briefing were now in prison. Uh, in, uh, under uh, uh, hostage arrest. And uh, soon the Iran-Iraq war began, and soon the United States decided that it would side at least partially with Saddam Hussein. Initially, they helped both sides. And in their effort to help both sides, we got the Iran-Contra. The United States, through the good offices of Israel, was giving Iran arms when Iran was in desperate situation in 1982-83. But at the same time, the United States was also helping Saddam Hussein. The United States was providing intelligence to Saddam Hussein. The United States was providing financial aid to Saddam Hussein. And much to the shame, I think, of the international community and to the United States. When Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against Iran, much more extensive level than Assad has ever used, virtually nobody said a word. Uh, not only they didn't say anything publicly, uh, anything serious, uh, but the aid continued. The aid to Saddam Hussein continued. So that began to sour relations even more, this uh, eight-year uh, war. And as I said, oil was one issue that the Americans had with the Shah. Nuclear was another. Iran began its nuclear program as early as 1955, when the US gave it a reactor for the Tehran University. Nothing was done with it. But in the 70s, the Shah had more money than he literally knew what to do with. And nuclear was now the new prestige thing. So Iran launched a nuclear program. But very soon, the US began to worry about where Iran was going with this nuclear program. Uh, contrary to what the regime says, and I've written about this several times. If you want, I can give you, if you just go on a Facebook site, uh, uh, there's my Stanford site, all of these links to these articles are there. You can get them for free. Uh, the United States begins to think, and it turns out to be right, that the Shah was going for dual-use technology, that he wasn't just have, uh, planning to have a peaceful nuclear program but he was putting all the pieces in place to have a peaceful nuclear program and then have short time for a breakout capacity, what you call breakout capacity. That is, know the, have the know-how to make a bomb, but make a political decision not to make it. Japan is a virtual nuclear state. Germany is a virtual nuclear state. South Africa is a virtual nuclear state. They can easily, South Africa has built it and then decided to uh, do away with it. 
uh, Germany and Japan can easily do it, but they have made the political decision not to do it. Iran clearly was going towards that under the Shah. The Americans were not willing to give the Shah the aid he needed. It took two and a half, three years of intense behind-door negotiations before the U.S. finally agreed to allow U.S. companies to bid for reactors and bid for this burgeoning market that was happening in Iran. Iran was supposed to build 20 reactors under the Shah. Stanford University uh, apparently has done a study. I haven't been able to find it. I've had several students try to find, look for it. But th th there are references to a Stanford report study that says Iran needs 20 nuclear reactors. Now, why Iran needs 20 nuclear reactors? The fact that Westinghouse apparently uh, finance that might have had something to do with the uh, results. But uh, uh, that tension uh, was relieved uh, be because the revolution, the revolution came. And Khomeini decided unilaterally that Iran doesn't need a nuclear program. Khomeini said Iran has all the gas it needs, and this nuclear program was a garbage forced on Iran by the Americans. So the Iranian reactor that was 75% finished, Germans were about to finish it. The reactor that is still not working, incidentally, 35 years <laughs> later, Khomeini said, we don't need it. They stopped it. And three years later, they relaunched the program, but this time secretly. And this time, they went essentially exactly where the Shah was going, for dual use. In their case, on several occasions, there are indications that they even tried to buy, for example, the design of a bomb. And that has created one of the lingering tensions between Iran and the United States, between Iran and the uh, UN, between Iran and the EU. Iran has been very clever. We can talk about the strategies that they have used. Uh, but as a result of these tensions, the U.S. finally decided to put very, very crippling sanctions on Iran. Iran now can't sell oil. <coughs> Iran can't access the money that it does get from selling oil because this Iran central bank is on an embargo, on a sanction list. So as the result of the last two years, the Iranian economy has come to a virtual uh, grinding halt. What helped the sanctions was the absolute incompetence and corruption of the Ahmadinejad government. The um, eight years of Ahmadinejad have been one of the most frivolous in Iranian history. I can give you some figures that will make you cry uh, if you have any concern for Iran every time I think about it. Uh, but those sanctions have really uh, taken the bite. And now, I think, Iran is ready to negotiate for the first time to arrive at some kind of an agreement. I think the outlines of the agreement are already there. Iran will continue enriching. Iran will give up enriching at 20%, because as you, uh, I'm sure, know, enriching is allowed within MPT. Uh, enriching above a certain level is not, because you can only use that for uh, weapons. Uh, and Iran will probably have to give up uh, the, some of the centrifuges. It now has 19,000 centrifuges uh, uh, online. It is not using all of it. Uh, and they're going to, I think, ship out some of the 20% enriched uranium that they have accumulated. Some people estimate that they might now have close to 900 kilos of 20% enriched uranium. And my sense is that within the next two, three months, you're going to continue seeing the continuation of this thaw that Mr. Rouhani uh, tried to herald. Mr. Rouhani, I think, has come to make a deal. Uh, I think Zarif has been allowed to become the prime mi uh, foreign minister because Iran thinks it now needs to make a deal. So we are at a very, very interesting moment. And I think that's an import uh, interesting time for me to stop because I've gone five minutes over my allotted time.
There are other countries in the region that doesn't look like they want a good relationship between Iran and the United States. In do, how important do you think their effort will be in a possible negotiation? Is it in a stop it or what is your prediction? What do you think? Well, uh, I suspect what you mean by countries uh, is maybe Israel. Uh, I think you probably mean, uh, yeah, but I think it's more than Israel. Uh, uh, I was reading a lead editorial in a Turkish magazine, Hurriyat, two days ago. And Hurriyat says, if Iran really uh, arrives at a peace with the United States, Turkey better rethink its option. Turkey ca can't any longer think that it can revive its Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. We better go back, the art article says, we better go back to trying to get back into EU. Because in the last three, four years, Turkey has decided that EU is not for it. Uh, heck with EU, they don't want us, we don't want them. Uh, and we'll go and establish this sort of uh, new Ottomanist empire. And b with Iran preoccupied, with Iran out of competition, with Iran in desperate need of uh, Turkey, Turkey has been making uh, like gangbusters off Iran. So uh, the Turkish 20% production increases, this boom is partially explained by the fact that Iran is thrown out of the market. Iran is thrown out. So does Turkey want normal uh, Iran that is, uh, uh, of course it doesn't. Does Saudi Arabia want uh, normalized relations with, Saudi Arabia right now has a thousand forces in Bahrain. Bahrain is a Shiite dominated country. Bahrain used to be till 1971. Iran claimed sovereignty over Bahrain. Iran has been unable to do anything. Uh, it complains about uh, Saudi forces. If, can you imagine if there was an Iranian regime that was uh, self-assured, more self-assured, that it would stand by and allow Saudi Arabia to send in a thousand troops there? Of course not. Uh, so, and Israel, uh, you know, uh, I think Israel has two policies on Iran. One, the public policy they uh, Netanyahu expresses. The other is the more discreet policy that uh, people who uh, are in uh, positions of authority uh, s sometimes say and speak. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu keeps talking the tough talk, and these other people keep talking the talk that says there is no military solution to this, and we have to find a way to uh, bring these guys back to negotiation. So uh, they play bad cop, good cop with the United States. Uh, and within Israel, there is clear uh, division. I mean, Netanyahu's speech was criticized in Israel by the Israeli uh, left center forces. Shimon Peres spoke essentially very clearly that saying that uh, we can't take this kind of a tone with the United States on Iran. Uh, and that will isolate us. So uh, all of these countries, uh, Russia, does Russia want uh, Iran's relations with the U.S. normalized? Of course not. Russia too is making like gangbusters. Uh, Russia is divided, they're now dividing up the oil and gas of the Caspian Sea. There's more oil and gas under the Caspian, they say, than under the Persian Gulf. Iran began negotiating by claiming that we need to get 50%. Now, Iran's official position is, can we get 12%? Uh, so Russia, too, is holding Iran hostage. Uh, with the help of Iran, uh, with the help of Hezbollah forces in Syria, with the help of Iranian Revolutionary Guards in Syria, uh, Russia has been allowed for the first time in 30 years to play the role of a big power in the international uh, seen. Do, so do they want normalized relations with the United States? No. But can they stop it? I don't think they can. Uh, if Iran is willing, and I think they now are, because they have no other choice, to make a deal, I think the United States wants to make a deal. I think Europe is pining to make a deal. Uh, I mean, Europe is just 
breaking at the seams to get back into the market. Uh, you know, the French Total company said, yes, we really want to get back into the market. Zarif was here last week, uh, 10 days ago. And they met with, the, I, I know, they met with a large group of you know, American businessmen, inviting them to come to Iran and uh, invest. Iran's oil minister just said three to four days ago that we welcome American investments in Iranian oil and gas. They're desperate, and this side, too, is willing to do it. Uh, I don't think the Obama administration has any uh, desire for another military confrontation. So if they can get a deal that they can convince the Israelis is not a sellout, I think they will. Uh, well, Hezbollah, I, I, I'm almost sure you mean the Hezbollah in Lebanon, because in Persian, Hezbollah has another connotation. Anybody who is almost crazy in politics, uh, we call them Hezbollahi. Uh, you don't want to be called Hezbollahi by, any, by Persian. That means uh, uh, you are uh, uh, an intransigent, radical, uncompromising person in politics. That sounds familiar uh, <laughs> in American <laughs> politics today. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so, but the Hezbollah you mean is a group that was created. They make no bones about it. Uh, the now leader of the group, uh, Sheikh Nasrullah, is on record. They were created on the suggestion of Khomeini with the help of IR, Iranian Revolutionary Guards beginning with in 1982. Iran has been the chief supplier of arms, training to them. Uh, there are now declassified reports, for example, about uh, Hezbollah units coming to Iran and helping the IRGC train uh, Iraqi insurgents uh, during the war with the United States and then sending them back into Iraq to fight the United States. Uh, and uh, they have received, uh, I, I think, billions of dollars on one account. After the end of the 36-day war, Iran apparently gave them $1 billion in cash. Hezbollah was able to go literally the day after the end of hostilities, door to door to the houses of Shiites whose houses were bombed, offering them up to $10,000 in cash uh, as a uh, rebuilding even uh, Safeco doesn't do it that fast in the, in the United States. Uh, so they are very much, uh, you know, I, I, a proxy of, the United, of Iran. And Iran's strategy has been very clear. Uh, you place them there, right next door to Israel, and the message is very clear. And they have delivered this message repeatedly. You attack Iran will use the Hezbollah uh, forces. And they have given, Hez Hezbollah now says they have over 100,000 missiles, many of them Shahab 3s. Shahab 3 can hit anywhere in Israel. They sent a drone over Israel a few months ago and flew over Israel's nuclear facilities. The message, Iran, again, if anybody missed it, Iran said, we want you to know we were over there and we were taking pictures. They were being very provocative. So if you were in the Oval Office with Hagel and Kerry and the President, and you had 20 minutes to tell them what to do, what would you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> the academic brief, right? <laughs> uh, you know, Bush came to uh, Stanford. Uh, and I did have a 20-minute conversation <laughs> with them. And uh, I told them, I said, you know, you are very popular in Iran because you're standing up to these guys. And he said, you wouldn't be bullshitting me. <laughs> I said, no, I, I do not bullshit the president of the United States. <laughs> so I, I would tell them uh, that this is a moment that a deal can be made. But it is also part of Iran's strategy 
declared a strategy to buy time, create reality on the ground, and then negotiate from a position of power. Remember, the Bush administration, and I, I told them that that is not a negotiable uh, position. The Bush administration's position was that we will not negotiate with you unless there are n not a single centrifuges churning in Iran. Fast forward seven years, now there are 17,000 centrifuges churning, at least 10,000 of them are, and the United States is willing to negotiate. How have, this re how have they done it? They've done it by creating reality on the ground. Uh, unfortunately, the book is not available in English, but a Persian translation of a talk he gave is available. Rouhani gave a very in interesting talk. It's on US, Iran's strategy in the nuclear negotiation. If you go online and go to a place called Crown Center the Papers, uh, the Crown Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Bandai University, uh, they have translated this very, very important essay where he lays out the strategy. So part of what I would tell him is that, look, uh, this is a moment these guys now need to make a deal. Uh, you should negotiate with them. I never believed that not negotiating with them is a policy. Not negotiating with them is a failure of policy. This doesn't have a military solution. Iran doesn't have a military solution. And Iran is a society, in my view, that is changing profoundly as we speak. Rouhani is not the uh, creator of Iranian moderation. Rouhani is the inevitable consequence of the changes that have come to Iranian society, and the clergy cannot stop it. Khamenei had no choice but to go back. Kh Rouhani is an absolute rejection of everything Khamenei has stood for over the last eight years. And he had no choice but to accept it. Why? Because three-fifths of Iranians are under the age of 30, and they don't buy this rhetoric. They want jobs. There are 40% unemployment in that age category. 65% of Iranian graduates with degrees in science are women. Are they going to allow this current fabrication of power where there are two, three token women uh, in minor jobs, not a single minister, not a single woman in the Guardian's Council, not a single woman in Council of Experts? Of course they're not going to take it. You look at the music, you look at the theater, you look at painting, you look at cinema. Iranian is burst, society is bursting. And it's bursting in ways completely away from the current status quo. So my suggestion to them would be what uh, George Kennan told the uh, Truman administration in 1945. Contain them. They will die out of their own incompetence and corruption and historical anachronism. This regime will not, in my view, survive. Now, uh, what the Iranian people are trying to do is remarkable. What the Iranian people are trying to do is change the regime without a regime change. In other words, they don't want a radical revolution. They don't want to happen in Iran what has happened in Iraq or in Syria. But they also don't want the current status quo. And if you look at Iranian history, Iranians are very good, patient, deliberate in doing exactly that, changing the regime without regime change. So negotiate with them. And the more you uh, negotiate, the more you ease this atmosphere of war, the more the Iranian Democrats, the more Iranian youth will have an opportunity to make the regime realize who is the boss in Iran. And the regime, in my view, is no longer the boss. You know, for people who are in prison, it's hard to accept what I'm saying. Uh, for people who are in Iran, it is not. They understand uh, that the tide has changed and the trajectory is in favor of democracy, equality, human rights. And I would also tell them, uh, and I've been telling, uh, writing about this many, many years, don't just negotiate on the nuclear issue. The human rights has to be part of the negotiation. Uh, you know, uh, George Shultz's model for negotiating with the evil empire. Uh, Shultz said, we can't not negotiate with these guys, 
but we can't just negotiate on salt one, for example. We'll talk about nuclear stuff in the morning and human rights in the afternoon. The Soviets agreed, thinking that this is a joke. It wasn't a joke. And it won't be a joke in Iran. Uh, I, I don't think the regime has a plan, but I think Iranian society has the possibility. And I tell you what, uh, Iran is the number one country in the world today in the brain drain. Iran's best and brightest leave uh, to the tune of 150 to 180,000 a year. Some of them are in this room. I recognize them from their facial uh, features and uh, their uh, noddings. Uh, so you have been the beneficiary of the brain drain in Iran. Uh, 150 to 180,000 a year. Iran has suffered more economically from the brain drain, according to it, the government, than from the war with Iraq, eight-year war. So it's a major, major drain. But where are these people going? They're coming here. There are 200 of them at Stanford. There are uh, several hundred of them at UCLA. Iranian diaspora is arguably one of the most successful diasporas in recent memory. It is now estimated that Iranians control or manage close to $700 billion of fortune in this country. From eBay to Google, from uh, Yahoo to Microsoft, to uh, NASA, uh, to every major university you go to, uh, there are Iranians. What this diaspora can do for the future of Iran is what Jews did for Israel, what Indians did for India, what Chinese did for the Chinese. They are the beachheads in teaching the Iranian society of the future where they can go back how to do business around the world. Some of them will go back. There are now a million and a half in the United States alone. Some of them will go back. Rouhani is very much trying to get them to go back. But he said, you know, Iran belongs to all the Iranians. Everybody should be able to come back. The next day, the uh, spokesperson for the judiciary says, yes, everybody can come back. But whether they can leave, we'll decide. <laughs> <laughs> so in Iran, as they say, there is always freedom to speak. There is not freedom after speech. <laughs> so uh, I think and then Iranian society itself is now extremely one of the best policies this regime has had. I think one of the great successes is in virtually eliminating illiteracy. So you have a very literate society. You have a very internet savvy society. It is estimated that Iran has close to 30 to 40 million internet users. Let me give you a statistic, uh, calling from the British Secret <laughs> Service. Uh, they want a report. Uh, <laughs> the book on the, on the Shah uh, that, that was referred to, I translated it into Persian, and the regime said, we're not going to allow it, because you know I'm a CIA bagman, of course. Uh, <laughs> So I said, I'm going to put it on the internet for free download in Iran. You know how many people, how many hits that website had in the first six m weeks? 10 million. 10 million people hit it. I, I don't know what the geographical, uh, I'm sure I can get it, but I haven't. And the number of people who are reading the book or have downloaded and have read it. It's just remarkable. So the, is this society thinking about this future? 
can Iran have been another uh, potential Indian uh, surrogate uh, Silicon Valley? There are 150, over 150 top level managers in Silicon Valley that are Iranian. They have a committee that they meet. I've given talks to them. They need to have either $50 million in business if they're managing it, or $5 million if they own it. 150 of these. I mean, I, some of the most fascinating work in the uh, Silicon Valley is done with some of these Iranians. And some of them go back, uh, go online and look up the name uh, Naim, and look at the number of companies he has taken public, and uh, look at what he is involved in. Uh, brilliant. They can be part of that. The regime, no, this regime uh, is not going to do it, in my view. We have time for one last question. Yes. I'm sorry, I. Okay, I, I mean, there are several issues that you have raised. First of all, the embargo, uh, the sanctions do not include medicine. Uh, I don't know whether you know that or not. It does not include medicine. Uh, and according to Iranian government's own officials, millions of dollars worth of uh, drugs uh, have been sitting in the customs. Moreover, millions, tens of millions more that was available to the government was given on, as a pretext to import drugs, and instead they imported Porsches and Lamborghinis. I'm quoting the Iranian government. So uh, yes, you're right. Sanctions are hurting the people of Iran. Uh, but I think the f major responsibility for the sanctions is on the shoulders of the Iranian regime. The deal they're now about to make is a deal they could have had six years ago. Six years ago, the Russian deal was more or less the same. Why didn't you make the deal then? Who is responsible for this intransigence? You say, uh, why is the world uh, worried about Iran? Read the editorials of the Kehan, which is supposedly the spokesperson for Mr. Khamenei. The day after Zarif wrote a, what I thought was a very astute, Jewish New Year uh, welcome to Jews of the world, read the editorial that the Kehan wrote. 
It's one of the most shameful anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli editorials I have ever read. Shut him up. If you, if this guy is your representative, Mr. Khamenei, if he was my representative, the day after he published something like this, I would take him to court. Not, a, not only he hasn't been, but he has been allowed to continue so much so that three days ago, Iran's foreign minister said, this paper sent me to the hospital. They lied so much about me. So, yes, sanctions are wrong. I completely agree with you. Uh, the downing of that Airbus was a tragedy. The United States should not have uh, overlooked it. The United States did offer, to, uh, you're not accurate there, the United States did offer to pay uh, some uh, compensation. It wasn't enough. I, I thought it was shamefully low. Uh, no, not without any apologies. Yeah. Because uh, what they argued, uh, and you know, uh, we can have a long discussion about that. I, I fully agree that should not have happened. But before that, I mean, you talk about the innocent Iranians being killed in that Airbus, and it's tragic, and I'm very sorry for everyone. Uh, but before that, virtually half of the Iranian Navy was sunk by the U.S. in the Persian Gulf because Iran kept challenging U.S. Navy. Iran mined the Persian Gulf while saying that it's not going to mine it. So the U.S. government, the U.S. Navy, took it on. How many sailors died there? So my sense, my suggestion is that Yes, we have to criticize wrong policies, but we also have to come up with uh, strategies that take into consideration uh, what, you know, the word that was very essential in Rouhani's UN speech. Very few people paid attention. He said, we need to address the legitimate concerns of the international community about our nuclear program. It was the first time that an Iranian official actually said, there are some legitimate concerns. You can't keep saying it's all Israel's fault that IAEA has referred Iran to Security Council six times. It can't all be a conspiracy. You have done something, some things wrong that don't make sense. You have hidden things and only admitted them when uh, they have been exposed. If you have a peaceful nuclear program and you know everybody is watching, then you have to be extra careful not to breach any laws. It's like uh, Clinton, when he knew everybody was watching, he should have been extra careful. Then we have Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> no, I mean that. It, you know, so it's the same kind of carelessness. I'm afraid we're going to have to cut this off because we've, we've gone over time. Um, before I ask you in, in joining me in thanking our, our speaker today, let me just say those of you who may be here for a class or who might be here for the calling reading program, there'll be uh, sign sheets out in the lobby out front here. Uh, now this has really been a treat to get you know an entire history lesson and a very interesting conversation to follow. Join me now in thanking Dr. Milani. Thank you. Thank you.